Morning, everyone. As always, it's a pleasure to see you and get the chance to gather together with our brethren to worship and sing praises unto him. If you would, this morning, we'll be starting off in Acts chapter 7, but we will be turning to a number of passages this morning. So I invite you to open up your Bibles and follow along with us to see what God's Word has to say and see what lessons we can take from it as we study a number of sections of Scripture this morning. We'll be beginning there in Acts chapter 7 in just a moment, examining a number of different passages throughout the New Testament this morning that many have labeled the sins against the Holy Spirit. And every time I come across these passages in Bible studies, in talks with people, whether it be private, whether it be in public settings like in the church building, there's always a multitude of questions that come up around these phrases. The grieving of the Holy Spirit, the unforgivable sins against the Holy Spirit, the blaspheming against the Holy Spirit. These are always passages that for many people are something that can be very difficult when you first come across them, especially when you're reading phrases and Hebrews and in Matthew where God is talking about no more sacrifice remains for sin. This is an unforgivable sin. And so I want to take some time to look at these different phrases this morning to see that they're not these just passages that are unable to be understood. They're really, at the end of the day, very simple things to look at and understand, but it's language that's used in a little bit of a different way than we're sometimes used to. So let's begin there in Acts chapter 7, beginning at that first phrase that Stephen uses there, the idea of resisting the Holy Spirit. There in Acts chapter 7, there in verse 51, let's begin there. This is towards the end of Stephen's sermon as he's preaching to the children of Israel, where he says, "...you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears." You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did so, so do you. The condemnation and the sin that Stephen talks about here, starting in Acts chapter 7, is the idea of resisting the Holy Spirit. But you just got to take a step back and look at it now. Okay, what does it mean to resist the Holy Spirit? Are they physically having an altercation with the Holy Spirit and coming to fisticuffs? Or is there something else here? Let me go on down to the next verse, and Stephen talks about this a little bit further. Which of your prophets did your fathers not persecute? They killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers. Stephen goes on to say, listen, you resisted the Holy Spirit, not only in the New Testament, you've resisted it in times past, in your forefathers, and you did this by resisting the prophets. You did this by resisting the word of God that was spoken through his prophets in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You know, you read that phrase, resisting the Holy Spirit at first, and it can be something that's like, well, how do we physically resist the Holy Spirit? What does that mean? Is he trying to possess us and we're trying to shove him off if some religions have tried to talk about it? No, he's just talking simply about the idea that God has spoken to you through men. The Holy Spirit has inspired men to speak and to write, and you have looked at that message, you have heard that message, and you have turned your back. Some of you have even gone so far as to kill the messengers, such as the prophets of old, and even Jesus Christ when he came to this earth. That's really simply, at the end of the day, what it means. But more than just those prophets of old I mentioned, they're resisting the apostles today. Peter makes the same type of analogy. If you turn with me over to 1 Peter chapter 1, he uses a very similar language that Stephen used there in Acts chapter 7. In 1 Peter 1, let's begin there in verse 10. 1 Peter 1, beginning in verse 10, Peter ta starts off talking about the prophets and leads into the apostles. Of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched, Peter writes carefully, who have prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who is in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering, the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into." Peter's saying, listen, the same spirit that led the prophets of old, that told us about who Christ was going to be, about the sacrifice that he was going to make, about the kingdom that he was going to establish, the things that they wished to know the fulfillment of, but God told them at that time, you're not going to see it. It's now happened. It's occurred. Some of you have seen it with your own eyes, Peter has said. 
And now that same spirit who you rejected beforehand in your history is speaking to you again through us. Here is the new covenant. Here's the new word. Here's the new things that we're supposed to be doing and following, not only for salvation, but for how we work and live in his kingdom. If you reject what the apostles are teaching, if you reject God's inspired word, that's what resisting the spirit means. You are telling the Holy Spirit, you are telling God, I want a different message. I don't want to follow your message. I am not satisfied with what you have given us. Is this a new concept that is foreign to Acts chapter 7? We find the same type of message throughout God's word. The wording is maybe slightly different than we see from some other areas, but the language and the message is still the same. If you resist God's word, it is a sin. If you disobey, if you don't want to listen to, if you don't want to follow God's word, it is a sin. If you want to submit to the Spirit, then that's where we get into Acts chapter 2. I'm sorry, I missed the passage there. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are of the command of the Lord. And so sometimes you get in talking with some folks that start talking about, well, the only things that are important in the New Testament are the words written in red. If you get into that type of argument, you get into that type of discussion, and someone is saying some, saying that, they're resisting the Holy Spirit. Because Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, listen, we're not speaking of our own accord. We're not writing of our own accord. We are writing and speaking as directed by the Holy Spirit. If you're resisting the apostles, you're resisting the Holy Spirit. Now the passage I was alluding to in Acts chapter 2 a moment ago, we submit to the Holy Spirit by following the examples and the teachings that the apostles have left to us. Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, passage is probably familiar to most of us. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and prayers. It started there in Acts chapter 2. Sometimes folk on ver focus on verse 37, talking about baptism, and that's an important verse. But the rest of it there in verse 42 continues on that same idea. They devoted themselves to the teachings of the apostles. If you want to word that in a slightly different way, they devoted themselves the things that the Holy Spirit inspired the apostles to speak. They submitted themselves to God and the Holy Spirit by obeying what God delivered through his apostles. That's the idea of resisting the Holy Spirit. And you really break it down that way and you look at it in that way. It's not this impossible concept to understand. But next, let's turn over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Now let's talk about the idea that Paul talks about of quenching the Spirit. 1 Thessalonians 5, beginning in verse 19, it's a very short verse. Do not quench the Spirit. The idea of quenching means to extinguish, to suppress, or to stifle. We've already ex explained and understood here, we're not talking about throwing a bucket of water on the Holy Spirit. We're talking about, again, most of the time we're talking about the Spirit. We're talking about God's Word and His message that has been delivered. So we're talking about quenching the Holy Spirit. It means in some way He's talking about extinguishing or suppressing or stifling the Word of God. And again, much like Stephen and much like Peter, Paul makes another comparison here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, the next, very next verse, verse 20, Do not despise prophecies. We're talking about prophecies. We're talking about the gift of prophecy that many have been given by the Holy Spirit in the New Testament in the first century. And if there were those that were despising the prophecies, where did those prophecies come from in the first place? It's not men standing on a street corner as some do today and just shouting prophecies at a wall, hoping one will eventually stick. They were speaking as they were directed by the Holy Spirit. So if you're despising, again, not only God's word, but the prophecies and the gift of prophecy that the Holy Spirit gave to some of those first century Christians, you're wanting to kind of downplay it and cover it up, and we don't want to talk about it, and we don't want to think about it. And man, those prophecies aren't preaching love from the pulpit when they get up and talk about those things. Sometimes those prophecies have to deal with some pretty dark and dreary stuff. We don't want to think about that. Then what are they doing? They're stifling, they're suppressing, they're quenching the Holy Spirit. 
some of the warnings and other passages that Paul talked about there. If you look over at 1 Timothy chapter 4, Paul talked about the same type of idea. 1 Timothy chapter 4, he told Timothy, do not neglect the gift that you have, which was given you by prophecy of the laying on of the hands of the, of the elders. So whether it was the gift that he had of speaking, of prophesying, of something here, he had some kind of miraculous gift that was given him, it sounds like. And so we can quench the Holy Spirit by neglecting our gifts. We can quench the Holy Spirit by being like the wicked servant in Matthew chapter 25, who the master gave him a talent, and the others that had talent, they went and multiplied, and they grew their gifts. And the one talent man went and did what in Matthew chapter 25? He buried his talent. He didn't put it to use. He stifled it. He buried it. He hid it away. He didn't grow. He didn't use it. He didn't do anything with it. No, you and I aren't going to be able to prophesy in the 21st century like they could in the first century. Those gifts died out. But we still have God's word. We still have gifts. We still have abilities that God gives us. If we let them sit and fester and go unused and rot away or we intentionally don't use them. That's the idea that Paul is warning against here, not only the Thessalonians, but to Timothy, that Christ is reminding those that he is preaching to when we have been given things by God through his word, through the Holy Spirit, we need to put them to use. We need to use it and not be something that we hide away like a lampstand under a basket. The idea in Ephesians chapter 3 that Paul talks about over there as well is the idea that, listen, the Holy Spirit is alive and is working in us and with us today. In Ephesians chapter 3, beginning there in verse 16. Ephesians 3 there in verse 16, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the, interman, in the inner man. Again, in verse 20, the same passage. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask, according to the power that works in us. When we are really putting our gifts and our abilities and the things that God has given us to use, when we are taking God's word and we are preaching it, the power doesn't lie in us. It lies in the Spirit. It lies in God's Word. It lies in the talents that He has given us. And we're going to quickly find that those abilities start to multiply. That the results start to multiply. It's not my excellent ability at speaking that I stand up here and that so many are able to understand God's Word and we get messages online of people that are able to be challenged or people that talk to me at the back of the building that say, you know, I gave a good lesson. It's not my talent that's working here. Only reason I'm able even to do this is because God's word is the thing doing the heavy lifting. I'm not doing anything spectacular, trying to go to God's word to point out some things to, that it says and to try and explain it to the best of my ability, sometimes failing so that others can understand God's word a little bit easier. The thing that's really doing the work here, the thing that's really powerful here is what the Spirit has given us. It's his power, it's his sacrifice, it's his word, it's his instructions that prick people to the heart. It's not my ability. The idea that we need to understand that we need to be quenching the passions of the flesh and feeding what God's word teaches us to feed. Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5 there in verse 22. Galatians 5 beginning in verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, and against such things there is no law. Here's the opposite of quenching the Spirit. Here's feeding it. Here's nourishing it. Here's helping it grow. Here's helping it multiply. It's taking what little bit God has given us in salvation and what talents he has given us in his word that he has given us and allowing us to grow and be fruitful and useful in his kingdom. Again, is this an impossible thing to understand? Is this a foreign concept that's only talked about in the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, that we need to be useful, that we need to be fruitful, that we need to be multiplying, that we need to be working in our service to the Lord. 
Now, this idea of quenching the spirit, again, is not some foreign concept that's impossible to understand. It's a message that's seen throughout God's Word. The third thing I want us to look at, though, is the idea back there in Ephesians chapter 4, this time there in verse 30, the idea of grieving the Holy Spirit. In Ephesians chapter 4, there beginning in verse 30, if you'll read there with me, Paul writes to the Ephesian brethren, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. The idea of grieving here now is to make sorrowful, to affect with sadness, or to offend. Now, we're not literally making the Holy Spirit weep tears. He doesn't have a physical body. God isn't physically weeping tears in the same way that we think about it. There's no physical body and physical tears coming out there. But it's the idea of affecting adversely. We're making him sorrowful. We're making him weep because of the things that he has done for us and given us, and we're turning around and doing something that makes him upset. Paul talks about this in some of the expanding verses around it. Some of the problems that the Ephesian brethren apparently had, if you back up just one verse to verse 29, Paul tells them, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but rather what is good and necessary for edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. Apparently part of the problem that the Ephesian brethren had is they were speaking corruptly. They were those that were Christians that had obeyed the gospel of Christ, that had been baptized, they knew what God's word said. They understood they were supposed to be these trumpets sounding forth the word of God. But what else was coming out of their lives? What else was coming out of their mouth? Corrupt and hateful, disgusting and sinful speech. Again, down the following verse to verse 31. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you, along with all malice. Not only in just how they were speaking, not only were their words bitter, angry, and evil, their conduct was starting to show. As not ones who had been serving God, as not ones who had been washed clean, but as ones who were letting themselves be affected by Satan's, Satan in their words, in their thoughts, and in their actions. Here's what's grieving the Holy Spirit and causing him to weep. They're supposed to be the set-apart people. We're supposed to be holy, useful for God, sounding forth the word. But when there's a hypocrisy here coming out that with one breath, we're speaking and teaching as God would have us speak and teach. We're treating one another the way that God wants us to treat one another and then turning around and speaking evil and corrupt and angry and malicious words and living in a malicious and evil way. Do you understand the pain that brings to God into the Spirit? That here is the Son that He sent to die for us, that we could come out of darkness and we're going right back into it while still pretending to be in the light. Not only that, we're showing others around us that we're just a hypocritical people and we besmirch and we sully the name of God. That's the idea that grieving the Holy Spirit is really hitting upon. No, you want to talk about the idea that Paul says we should be doing. He says, no, let no corrupt words proceed out of your mouth, but rather what is good and necessary for edification that it may impart grace to the hearer. That old adage, if you don't have something nice to say, don't say it at all. That our words shouldn't be angry and malicious and hateful with the purpose of tearing people down all the time, but with the purpose of trying to build them up. That doesn't, don't, that doesn't mean don't speak on things that are harsh. It doesn't mean don't point out sin, but have the purpose, have the language, live the life that is trying to build people up and bring them out of darkness into the light. That makes the spirit rejoice. That makes the angels in heaven rejoice. We're trying to edify people. We help bring them out of darkness. They understand, no, I need to be baptized. I need to live faithfully. That's when God and the angels in heaven rejoice. That's what we should be living. That's how we should be acting. Our conduct should be righteous, Paul says there in verse 28 and in verse 32. 
Verse 28, Paul tells the Ephesian brethren, let him who steal, stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor working with his hands what is good, that he may give something to him who has need. As well as in verse 40, I'm sorry, verse 32, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God and Christ forgave you. What makes God rejoice is when we live a righteous life that is serving him. What makes the Holy Spirit rejoice is we're taking the blessings that God has given us, we're using them to the best of our abilities, and we're sharing it with those around us. We grieve the Holy Spirit when we, as James 3 and verse 10 talks about, out of the same mouth proceed both blessing and cursing. The spring pour, for, pour forth from the same opening both fresh and salt water. That's what grieves the Holy Spirit when we live this hypocritical double standard. When we're trying to be faithful and serve God, or we're saying we're trying to be faithful and serve God, but also live in Satan, live in darkness, and do as he wishes. It's the things we got to be watchful for or else we're sinning against the Holy Spirit. All right, two more left. Next, turn with me to Hebrews chapter 10. Here's one of the ones that is a little bit more popular that we talk about sometimes and is a little bit more of a stumbling block for some folks because when you read Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 9, it talks about insulting the Spirit. The language that is used there is some that trips some folks up. In Hebrews 10 beginning in verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will, be, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? who has counted the blood of the covenant of which he has sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. Some of your translations may say, who has despited the spirit of grace or who has outraged the spirit of grace. Here's this idea of insulting the spirit. What does it mean to insult the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to despite or to make the Holy Spirit outraged? Well, again, let's look at the context as we have with each of these. Hebrews chapter 10, let's back up to verse 26. If we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy of those who have trampled the Son of God underfoot and have counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now the context here is what trips some folks up. You back up to verse 26. If we sin willfully after having received a knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. That's what makes some people a little bit unsettled when they read this verse. Here's one of two places, we'll read Matthew chapter 12 here in a few moments, that God talks about this idea that if we insult the Spirit, if we sin against the Holy Spirit, some folks have taken this to mean, okay, this is some unforgivable sin. Is that what this passage means? Christ's blood said he can wipe away anything. Any sin can be forgiven. Is he contradicting himself here? No, what he's talking about here is if you continue to sin willfully after receiving the knowledge of the truth. Either as I believe it's talking about here, after becoming a Christian, or after receiving the knowledge of knowing the difference now between good and evil, of knowing what God has sacrificed, how he has sent his son to die for our sins, and you trample that underfoot. What it means there that it means there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins is that there's not going to be a new covenant. Christ isn't going to come down and die again for you or for me. This is it. Here's the answer that we just read a few moments ago that the prophets long to look into. Here is how we can escape darkness and we can escape sin. We are baptized and we remain 
faithful to the best of our ability in the Lord's kingdom. That we understand now what the difference is between sin and righteousness and we try to live righteously. If we make the conscience willful decision, I don't care what Christ has done for me. I do not care what God has done for me. I'm going to continue to live in sin or I'm going to return to sin. We are trampling underfoot Christ's sacrifice and there's not going to be any other option. You either follow God and live righteously the way that he has commanded or you live in sin and you face eternal damnation and hellfire. Those are the two options there. It's not that, okay, if you ever sin after becoming a Christian, then you're eternally lost and there's no hope and it's unforgivable. That's not what this passage means. The other idea we read back in Hebrews chapter 6 that follows along the same idea. If we sin, the Hebrew writer talks about this as well, we can still be forgiven. We can still show godly sorrow. In fact, we should if we sin after we become a Christian. We'll still be forgiven. But if we have this same attitude that the Hebrew writer was talking about in Hebrews chapter 10, that no, I don't care that I have trampled underfoot God's sacrifice and his blood. That's when we have this idea of insulting the spirit, of outraging the spirit. Hebrews chapter 6, picking up there in verse 4. It is impossible for those who were once enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the good word of God and the power of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put him to open shame. For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it was cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. Here's something very similar to what we've already been talking about this morning. If we have obeyed God, if we understand what it takes to be righteous and to live faithfully, if we are bearing fruit, if we are a righteous Christian, if we are growing, if we are serving him faithfully, we are pleasing to God. If, as Hebrews 6 and verse 8 talks about, we are bearing thorns and briars. As Jesus talked about in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew chapter 6, if we are an unfruitful tree, what's going to be done with us? We're going to be cut down and we're going to be thrown into the fire. There's going to be no other sacrifice. There's not going to be any more time. We're not going to just keep waiting forever for you to return. If you sin, you have to have godly sorrow. You have to repent. You have to return, and you'll bear good fruit. But if you continue just stubborn and bullheadedly that I have no remorse for the sin that I am doing, I am going to continue in it. There's nothing else that's going to save you. It's Christ's blood or nothing. That's what he's talking about here. Can you see how this is an outrageous thing to God? Can you see how insulting this is to God? That from his perspective, he sent his son to die on the cross for our sins. Unjustly crucified, as we talked about last week so that you and I could be forgiven, so that we could be in the light, so that we could be in his kingdom. And we're openly spitting in his face and telling him, I don't care what you've done. I don't care what your son has done. I don't care about the word that the Holy Spirit has delivered to us. I'm going to continue in sin. What God is saying in so many words here is this is your one out. This is the only opportunity for freedom and salvation from sin. It is the blood of Christ and it is obeying him faithfully until death. There will be no new covenant. There will be no new sacrifices. There will be nothing else that you can do. It's this or you're producing thorns and bristles and you will be cut down and thrown into the fire. That's why the call from him in Hebrews chapter 3, back up just with me a couple more chapters, is a warning here. Don't become hardened by sin. Don't get to this point that your hearts can no longer be pricked. That you have no remorse ever again for the sin that you're committing. 
Hebrews chapter 3, if you back up with me there to verse 12. Hebrews 3, beginning in verse 12, reads, Beware, brethren, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another today, daily, while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ, and if we hold the beginning of our confidence, steadfast to the end. The danger that the Hebrew writer was addressing in chapter 6, in chapter 10, and throughout the book, was don't become hardened by the deceitfulness of sin so that you can no longer be pricked to the heart. That you can no longer distinguish between righteous and unrighteousness. That you no longer care about what you're doing, how you're living, how it affects others, and most importantly, how it affects God, His Son, and the Holy Spirit who have done so much for us. That's the point we get to in our life. No, there is no more sacrifice for sin. It doesn't mean it's unforgivable. It doesn't mean we can't turn back to God. But that if you're that hardened, if you're that stubborn and set on living in sin, there won't be any other option. That's it. There won't be some change of heart when you stand before God in judgment. That, nope, you get one last chance. You can repent or you can go to hell for all of eternity. While what you have, he promises, is today. You're not promised tomorrow. You're not promised any more time. You take the opportunity while you still have today. Don't let it pass you by. One last phrase. In a similar vein to Hebrews chapter 10, this is the other one that I believe is probably the most misconstrued and taken out of context and misunderstood by some folks. Matthew chapter 12 Jesus talks about the unforgivable sin of blaspheming the Spirit. In Matthew chapter 12, beginning there in verse 31, if you read there with me, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be, given for, will be forgiven men, but blasphemy against the Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven him. Whatever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven him, either in this age or the age to come. And this is one along the same lines of Hebrews chapter 10 that a lot of folks say, okay, what does it mean to blaspheme the Holy Spirit? What does it mean that there's this unforgivable sin that if I do this once, am I just eternally lost no matter what I do? I can never be saved. I better make sure I know what this blasphemy against the Holy Spirit is. Just like all these other verses, let's take these words in context with what Jesus is talking about here. Back up with me about 10 verses here to verse 22. Let's see what Jesus has been doing. Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, that is Christ, blind and mute. Christ healed him so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And the multitudes were amazed and said, could this be the son of David? Demon-possessed man was just brought to Christ. He healed him. He was able to see now. He's able to speak now. The multitudes are amazed. Some of them are even recognizing, hey, could this be the Messiah? Could this be this fulfillment of prophecy? And then notice what the Pharisees said as they're standing there. Verse 24, now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Here's the big key verse in this section here. Christ has just healed a man of demon possession. And the Pharisees' answer is, no, God didn't give him this power. Satan gave him this power to cast out one of Satan's own minions. Now, does that sound ridiculous? It does to me, and Christ apparently thought so as well, because if you continue on in verse 25, but Jesus knew their thoughts and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation. Every city or house divided against itself will not stand. If Satan casts out Satan, he is, a divi he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I cast out demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they shall be your judges." But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. Christ explains there's only one possible way that even makes the remotest lick of sense 
as to how this demon was cast out. It had to be by God's power and God's power alone. If Satan is divided against himself, he's defeating himself, and that makes no sense. If Christ is the only one casting out the demons by Satan, then who are the rest of these Pharisees and sons and everybody else casting out demons? Are they doing it by Satan too, or are they doing it by God? It's really this ridiculous statement by the Pharisees that gets Christ kind of riled up. How ridiculous and far-reaching and absurd of a statement do you have to make to pretend that this is anything other than God's power? To even think the idea that, nope, the only way that Christ has done this is Satan is casting out Satan just shows how stubborn the Pharisees are that they want to continue in their sin and not accept Christ as the Messiah. It's a whole other lesson for a different time. But here's the real problem here that Christ is touching on. If you are attributing God's power to Satan, now we have a problem. You have just blasphemed God and you have blasphemed the Spirit. You have blasphemed the message that God has been delivering here and showing you proof that He is in control. That the words that Christ is speaking come from God. Here is miraculous power to back it up that He is God's messenger and you are attributing this power to Satan. I like the way that Mark chapter 3, the parallel accounts, puts this. Or in Mark chapter 3 there in verse 28 and down through verse 30. Mark chapter 3 beginning in verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, Jesus says, all sins will be forgiven of you, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. Because they said he has an unclean spirit. So because they were saying that Christ himself was possessed by an unclean spirit. That's the only way that this unclean spirit could possibly be cast out. They had just completely undermined the entirety of God's power. It's a very similar type of statement to what we read in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 26 a moment ago. If the only one with power to cast out demons is Satan himself and not God, and Satan is divided against himself, who can we possibly turn to for salvation? Christ says, if we're going to follow the Pharisees' line of thinking here to its end, that the only one with power is Satan, is there any possible way to escape darkness, escape Satan's clutches, and to escape his chains? What the Pharisees have just said here is God has no power against Satan whatsoever. It's not that they have said something that is unforgivable that they can never be forgiven of. Given of. If they continue in this line of thinking, there is no salvation. There is no ability to escape darkness. There is no forgiveness of sin because you've just said God has no power and the only one with power is Satan. That's what it means to be blaspheming the Holy Spirit here. If we take God's word and we say, nope, this is just a trick by Satan to keep people confused and twisted up and following after some antiquated book to keep people subjugated to themselves. If some folks do today, say the Bible is this outdated piece of literature that was used by kings and rulers to keep a people subjected to themselves. They say that that's the work of Satan. They say it's the work of man. It cannot be from the power of God. God had no handiwork in it. Then that's blaspheming the Spirit. When you have said there is no God, there is no power of God, then you're right. There is no salvation for you. What you're preaching, what the Pharisees are preaching, what men today are preaching when they say something similar is there is no hope. Satan is the only one with power, so we will be forever stuck in his clutches 
There is no escaping death. There is no escaping sin. We're stuck here forever without hope, without any hope. If we attribute God's power, His mercy, His love, His long-suffering, His sacrifice, if we attribute everything that God's Word has to say about this, of the message that has been delivered to not only the first century saints, but has been preserved for us in the, even in the 21st century, if all of that gets attributed to Satan or other men and not to God and not to the Holy Spirit, then how in the world are you going to be saved? How in the world is salvation ever going to come? What do you have to look forward to in this life? How do, how do you have hope? Because the picture you're painting there, whether you realize it or not, whether the Pharisees realize it or not, when you speak like this, is that we come into this world. We live in a sinful and wicked generation. And that we die either without hope or we die and go to hell and there was nothing we could do to change it. That's what it means to blaspheme the Holy Spirit. And unless you turn away from that line of thinking, you're going to live without hope for the rest of your life and throughout eternity. I haven't talked this morning about what you need to do in order to become a Christian, but we have talked, I think, pretty well at length this morning about what you need to do in order to be righteous and to stay a Christian. That here is God's word that has been delivered once for all for you and me. Here's the recounting of how Christ has come into this world and died for your sins and for mine. Here's the proof that backs up that he is the Son of God that has died for your sake and for mine. And here's the Holy Spirit's message that has been spoken through the apostles and through the inspired writers of the, God's word so that you and I can read and understand and follow what God has written. Now you have to make a choice, the same as those Ephesian brethren, the same as those brethren of Thessalonica, the same as those in Matthew 12, the same as those in the book of Hebrews. Are you going to obey God's word, or are you going to turn and blaspheme and spurn and insult the Spirit and God, and what He has done for you and me. If you're here this morning and you are not a Christian, you have a choice. You can obey God faithfully today. You can show godly sorrow. You can repent and turn away from your sins, and you can be baptized. You can start living and serving Him faithfully with whatever time you have left on this earth. But do it while it is still called the day. The only thing you are promised is today. You're not even promised the end of today. You're promised right now because you're living in it. So if there's something that needs to be done as far as that is concerned, then you need to come forward and say those things and make it right as we stand and sing the song in a moment. If you are living in sin now as a Christian and you've turned back to darkness, I think I confused you there with the way I worded that there. You've gone back into sin as a Christian then you are spurning, you are insulting the spirit of grace, you are trampling underfoot Christ's blood yet again. You still have today to make that right. Don't let the time pass you by. If that is the case this morning, then come forward now, now this time, as together we stand and sing the song that has been selected.